Thank you. <clears throat> Colossal. Wow, that's, that's huge. Anyway, so uh, my first uh, question that the uh, interviewee asked me is, am I uh, uh, feeling cold? Yes. <laughs> and uh, actually, I just want to break the monotony. If you will allow me, I would like to uh, uh, to do a talent, if, if that's okay with you. I will not sing, but uh, you know, just to break the monotony. Who uh, is the best? Nakaitid ng bisaya. All right, uh, to our foreign friends, uh, don't worry because I will translate it for you. Uh, okay. Ano man ng radio station nga ni nga puro na lang kabalak kabaklaan. Siguro ilipat natin sa ibang channel. Oh, meron pa lang Picon. PH 2004 dito sa Makati Sports Club. And ang alam ko, maraming mga pogi at mga magaganda yung magjo-join dito sa conference na to. And ang dami pang gwapo. <clears throat> Siguro, oh, may bayad pala, 4,000 pesos. Ang mahal naman ito. Wala na akong... Anyway, mang gate crash na lang tayo. <clears throat> oh! Meron pa lang talk about site reliability engineering. Siguro maganda kung uh, tingnan natin. Anyway, so it's just a short uh, introduction of me. Anyway, so uh, thank you everyone. Um, uh, I will talk about site reliability engineering, um, uh, a Python developer's perspective. So. Um, I'm uh, actually currently working for Talino Labs. It's a fintech company uh, managing different uh, fintech platforms, um, especially for banks here in the Philippines. And uh, I also work for uh, Pantheon as a uh, customer success engineer. So, <clears throat> po kayo. Uh, marami pang upuan. And I also worked uh, before at X-Team. X-Team is the company behind Twitter, the early days of Twitter. And um, I also worked at the uh, World Bank. And um, yeah. So my work at the World Bank is <clears throat> I actually uh, went to Basilan, to Lano del Norte, Maguindanao. And I trained some of the ex-MILF in, in the area and <clears throat> uh, in preparation for the Bangsamoro. So it was actually fun. Uh, uh, we teach them how to build uh, websites. Anyway, so our agenda for today is, well, we introduction to DevOps. Uh, typical continuous integration flow, tools that we use uh, as a DevOps SRE in my previous companies, and then we'll talk about SRE, and more SRE, and uh, lessons learned from a decade of uh, practicing DevOps and SRE. Um, <clears throat> all right, um, you're ready? All right, so what is DevOps? Well, <clears throat> um, uh, may I know where the DevOps in the house? Or in, in the operation? Uh, developers. Moral supporters. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so DevOps is the combination of cultural philosophies and uh, practices and tools that basically increase the organization's ability to deliver uh, applications, services, uh, and 
at a high uh, fast pace uh, manner. And and most of the questions that usually talks about uh, DevOps is that uh, it's between development and operation and there's a middle person in there. Um, uh, way back 2010, 2011, um, I used to work at abscbnnews.com. Uh, I built uh, the news.com at that time. So remember when Manny Pacquiao fights, I was actually there monitoring to make sure that it doesn't go down, that there's no outage during the fight of Manny Pacquiao. So um, I call myself there as, as a as an agent, agent of uh, development. So, <laughs> um, yun lang. Um, uh, well, the drawback is that every time that there's a Manny Pacquiao's fight, you cannot go. You cannot go uh, to a date because um, you have to make sure that the site is up and running. Um, and, um, as a developers during the time, um, so this was early 2009, 2010, and there is no even, I mean, the only continuous integration tools that we use, this is Jenkins at that time. So, and as a DevOps, these are the typical software process that we are using in our organizations, right? So one of the focus of the DevOps are building pipelines from idea to requirements. And then, uh, of course, developers code it, and then test it, then build it, and then deploy. And then just, you know, checking the logs, if there are issues and things like that. And imagine during the time, these are all manually uh, implemented. And it takes time to release a software. But nowadays, we have lots of uh, uh, continuous integration. So we have Circle CI, we have GitHub Action, we have GitLab, um, we have Travis. If you're into Red Hat, there's uh, there's um, a built-in CI, Krypton, Tekton, and a lot more. And as a DevOps engineer, you need to make sure that you have basic understanding of the system administration. You should know how Linux works, and you should have basic knowledge about networking so that you know how to, to debug if there's uh, if there's a need to check some website, if it's up and running, you know, like, like tools like uh, NS Lookup or Ping or, um, <clears throat> and, 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 and number three, you need to have a uh, security knowledge about how do you, how you deploy the application. And, <clears throat> In way back 2010, these are all manually operated, and and each of these uh, so system administrations, you have a specific person to do that, and you also have a networking guy uh, by your side, and security. But nowadays, all of these is just a one-man guy. And, and that's you, DevOps. <clears throat> and as, as a Python developer, um, this is my, I mean, my second language because my first language is PHP. And then I transitioned to Python. So as a Python growing, uh, doing infrastructure and doing DevOps, I kind of fun of making our tools. So every time that we need some infrastructure automation, uh, my first choice is Python. And 
Um, I am actually fond of Flask. So usually we use this, um, uh, if you're familiar with uh, running shell script uh, on Python. So we're usually using um, subprocess. And sometimes we're using the standard um, checkout, <laughs> uh, checkout, check output shell script. And this is very, very straightforward. And um, this is just one of the tools that I usually um, use. I mean, just as a, a way of, may it be an API or just to run a command. And uh, now, sorry, it, it's kind of uh, blurred, but um, I'm also using Python in our company to run uh, chat GPT. So this particular snippet is I'm actually um, putting this on our uh, cluster. So when it boots our pods, it actually checks all the logs for a very unique errors and feed it to our chat GPT. And ChatGPT will provide us a very detailed uh, error information. So sometimes ChatGPT, if you uh, kind of uh, put some parameters, it will also give you a very detailed information. Sometimes it, it will also give you solutions on how to fix it. So uh, for our DevOps SRE, it will be easier for us to Okay, we find the error, we found the bug, but how can we fix it? At least, you just need to click it and you will see the solution provided by, uh, by the chat GPT. So that's actually one of the benefits of AI on, in Nisari. <clears throat> okay, um, probably some of you here, um, in the development part, you're actually using Docker Compose, right? And then when you transition to, if you want to deploy it in Kubernetes, sometimes you have to convert it to Docker file, right? And I'm actually fond of using Compose. So you can use it to easily convert all your Docker Compose to Docker file. Very easy. Um, <clears throat> so it's just one of the tools that you were using. And of course, Terraform. <clears throat> so uh, we, we're managing a fintech uh, application, uh, mobile and web, and our infrastructure is being managed by Terraform. Well, not all, not 100%, um, but we're heavily using Terraform uh, in AWS. And I don't know if you're familiar with Pulumi. Pulumi is actually getting more uh, it has a very nice potential. Okay, so now the difference between uh, Terraform and Pulumi is that as a Python developer, because of course, if you're using Terraform, you're dealing with YAML files, right? And if, you're, if you have a heart in, as a Python developer, you really wanted to, to create your, to build your infrastructure using your Python, using your co Python codes. And Pulumi is actually one of the solutions that uh, that you can explore, uh, at least if you're writing a very complex, uh, very, in, I mean, very complex in terms of logic, so you can use Pulumi. And as you can see, I mean, um, sorry, but um, <clears throat> very straightforward. Um, if you're a Python developer, you would surely understand right away on, you can, um, so this is this sample code here will provision a cluster, a Kubernetes cluster. So you can basically uh, import uh, Pulumi package and AWS, and then you just need to specify the the memory, CPU, the cluster, the region, and you just need to run. Uh, you just need to execute the Pulumi to provision it. <clears throat> so that's 
uh, easy. And back to our main topic, uh, so the, in the DevOps side, that uh, developers often uh, they're complaining. I need a server now, na. <clears throat> 10 years ago, 11 years ago, when I was at ABS, <clears throat> every time there's Mani Pacquiao, we had to set two weeks of, of uh, gap because during the time, well, there's a cloud provider. There's no AWS. There's no um, Azure at that time. But there are actually cloud provider or, or a data center. So it will take two weeks to upgrade your CPU and memory because what, what happens there is that uh, you have to buy basically all the CPU and memory and then the, uh, the IT in the US will be the one to install it. And then after two weeks, you'll say, hey, uh, is my machine ready? But nowadays, it's just a one click of a button and you have all the, your clusters. You have all your provisions in provision in, in, in few minutes, few seconds. <clears throat> and number two, I want access to the production systems. So sometimes it's easy to, I mean, our developer sides, sometimes it's easy to say that access lang naman yun eh. I mean, it's just, it's just an access. But for the operation, um, there are some policies that needs to be, that needs to be complied with. Uh, like, for example, um, you cannot just give out to a developer with, with, with a lower access level. Uh, he needs to be a senior dev before you can pr provide um, a higher uh, access grant. So those kind of things are needed to be uh, understood by developers. That's why uh, DevOps should understand this that there are also security compliance that needs to be guided before you can give out access to employees. And number three, something is wrong. Whose fault is it? So um, on the development side, they will say, it's working on my machine. It's working on my laptop. And pagdating naman on the admin or the operation or the sysad, they will say, oh, your application doesn't work in this environment. Now, the conflict is they will blame each other. And uh, the reason there's a DevOps is because uh, the culture should have a blameless um, um, behavior. I mean, there shouldn't be somebody to be blamed, but uh, you have to change the, the mindset um, and, and, and that's why DevOps was uh, created or uh, coined and that's, that's the problem. So how, <clears throat> how to solve it? Of course, solving it by automating it and as a DevOps uh, you are expected to be knowledgeable in, in setting up your setting up your your pipelines. Um, so that is one. Um, and if you will, um, if you will read this diagram, it's basically development. Uh, when developers code it, put it, push it in the repository, and then after. Uh, pushing it in the repository and you run some tests and once it's completed then you package it by using build tools like maven if you're developing java or npm if you're developing node.js and then once it's completed then you build it in docker and then uh, once your image is completely pushed then you push it to the artifact repository. So what are this artifact repository? It could be AWS EZR in when if you are in AWS or maybe if you're in GCP you'll use uh, Google Cloud Registry GCR and 
and then you push it to your uh, server. All right, 15 minutes. What is SRE? <clears throat> so SRE, basically, you need to have a knowledge of DevOps. Uh, sabi nga ni Google is that um, SRE is uh, mind that all the operation, all the operations guys are actually sales and people that are non-technical. And Google says that uh, to have an SRE, you need to you need to place uh, software developers, software engineers in in the operation. So employing software developers in the operation, and that's what they call SRE. So sabi nga is uh, according to Red Hat, site uh, SRE is a software engineering approach. Um, to IT operations, SRE uses software tool to manage systems, okay, and uh, solve problems and automate operations. Um, when I was a DevOps, uh, I mean, we're, we're just uh, on our own, but with SRE, you need to make sure that you're using uh, standards in the operation, make sure that all the all the requests are being ticketed. So you need to use um, a ticketing system to track all of your um, activities, operation activities or development activities. May it be uh, provisioning a server. And same with Google, if you will read it, they're actually, they have the same uh, definition. And, um, and same with Dynatrace. <clears throat> and as you can see here, SRE versus DevOps. Um, SRE um, focuses on the operation, incident response, um, monitoring and alerting, capacity planning. While DevOps focuses on the pipelines, release automation, environment builds, um, configuration management and infrastructure as a code. And SRE basically, uh, SRE implements DevOps. So you need to cover all of this uh, if you're doing SRE. So I have the 10 minutes, so maybe I will skip some of these and uh, go to, oh, sorry. Uh, monitoring, okay. So monitoring and alerting. Um, there's actually a difference between monitoring and observability. So um, one of the big differences of monitoring is, well, you monitor the, the graphs, the metrics, and then if you see something, you alert it. And you can automate this in AWS. So that's monitoring. And observability is a different beast because you're not just monitoring it, you're also looking for some bugs, specific bugs, and how to solve it. So that's observability. So you need to trace everything and make sure that you understand the process and then that's, and you go to your development team and you present your uh, findings. That's observability, uh, the difference between them. Um, um, this was uh, 10 years ago while I was working with Antion. Um, we're actually using New Relic. New Relic is a performance uh, tool that is very um, uh, valuable as a developer and at the same time as, as ops because you will see the difference and you will not see this in action. You will only see this in metrics. So that is the beauty of observability. <clears throat> and uh, let's just skip. Um, okay. Lessons learned from a decade of practicing uh, DevOps. 
So recovery mechanism should be fully tested before an emergency. Okay, sometimes before you launch and you have a big project, sometimes you miss to cover some of the most important things. Uh, probably uh, you forgot to place the actual users, the actual roles. So it is very important to fully test this um, uh, before, you, before you will um, uh, experience the emergency. And number two, when your containerized application AWS is growing bigger, I would strongly suggest that you use AWS load balancer instead of uh, Nginx controller. Um, so this um, number one is you're in AWS and AWS load balancer application, AWS application load balancer has all the ingredients uh, like CloudFront or if you wanna provide uh, firewall or edge. So with ALB, it's already there. You just need to, um, you just need to implement it by placing a flag, and that's it. While Nginx, medyo uh, mahirap pa because sometimes well we experience some messed up with our Nginx, um, and um, and as you can see the the AWS Ingress YAML and the uh, Nginx Ingress, uh, they're like identical in terms of, of the configuration. But the only difference is the, the flag and the metadata. <clears throat> Number three, um, test for disaster resilience. Verifies that your service or system could survive in the event uh, faults, latency, disruption. Recovery testing verifies that your service can transition back um, to home stasis or, yeah, sorry. Um, number four, when migrating a massive containerized application from a cloud provider, AWS, GCP. So the reason why I actually, um, uh, we have uh, uh, 200,000 live sites from Rackspace. These are all containers application. We have uh, less than um, uh, probably 500 nodes, worker nodes in Rackspace. And we wanted to migrate it to GCP. And these are, these are all live sites, 200,000 200, live sites. And then we migrated from Rackspace to GCP in two weeks. So the lessons learned there is that but the containerized the container runtime that you are using, if you're doing DIY, should be supported with your uh, destination or your cloud provider. So as we're actually using LXC as container runtime from Rackspace, then we migrated to GCP since LXC is supported by, by uh, uh, GCP. We were able to transition it, to migrate seamlessly. And we were, I think, in two weeks. And we were blogged or we were featured at uh, uh, Google Cloud. <clears throat> and our, our clients didn't really no notice that they're already in GCP. They just noticed that uh, they're a bit faster now. And we saved 40% um, uh, uh, in the infrastructure cost. And that 40%, I think that's a million dollar during the migration. <clears throat> and number five, when clearing out your AWS accounts, okay, um, for, for some guys or some companies, most of the companies you are actually, um, we, you, ha you have multiple accounts in AWS. And sometimes um, you're, you're dedicating a separate account for your big clients, right? And by the time that you have deployed or migrated the application and you're about to delete that particular account, just don't manually delete them, but nuke them. And there's actually a tool, um, it says AWS nuke. 
So you nuke that account, and the same problem is when you manually delete them, you will, you will have leftovers. You, you will have some orphaned resources, and that's actually sakit ng ulo. It's, it's, it's really pain in the ass. So you have to use this uh, script um, to nuke it. And it's really uh, very nice to use. And uh, sorry, guys, I am out of time. Uh, sorry for skipping that, but I will release this uh, um, uh, presentation after this talk. So, thank you. If anyone has any questions, feel free to come here and line up. So, yeah. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you for the talk. Uh, really good. Hope we had more time. Um, second is, what do you do when your responsibility is like a liability, but the problem is that you have a real-time integration of third party, which isn't reliable? The reason I ask is because for the past four years, for two different companies, site reliability has been my initiative or my responsibility. But I'm not really a site reliability engineer. Mm -hmm. Done all the engineering stuff, read all the SRA books. But to be honest, I spend more time doing product management, account management, and sometimes even politics. So how do I go about it? I, I, I can't tell the customers, it's not our fault. They're done. OK. Um, <clears throat> um, we actually experienced that in my previous company. Um, uh, remember when AWS S3 down, I think of, uh, a couple of years ago, before pandemic. Yeah. And as developers in the ground, we are really, really want to say to our customers that this is not our fault, but, a, but S3. But we cannot say that because we have an NDA, yeah. SLA, that we cannot divulge our that particular information. So now the the problem is on us that we really have to uh, take the responsibility because that's what the policy and that's what what we agreed. So I think um, this is the question of uh, policy making uh, during the contract signing. Yeah. That uh, what if there is a downtime? Can we? Can we blame you guys? And if they say yes, then that solves your problem, right? Unfortunately, every time I come in, the contract has already been signed, and it says <laughs> we're at fault. Yeah, that's that's really sucks. And, we uh, try to change the the contract <clears throat> since then, mm. but like the existing customers, like we, I mean, the AWS downtime was huge, mm. uh, but at least it was all over the news. Right. But for us, like, oh, it's down again. Every week we have an outage. Like, it looks like we're the ones who is irresponsible. Even then, though it's not us. Um, is, that is it possible to change your third-party service provider? That's usually another, like, tactic. You try to have redundancy, have a different provider, mm. so and so forth. But sometimes there's really no, no, no option. For example, oh, you want to integrate with PNP Clearance. Mm -hmm. There's only one service for that, and PHP clear as that page goes down every week. Because the, the, the implication of that is that you will violate your PTO, yeah. your, your, your RPO. Yeah. And, and if that, and I don't know, maybe there's a contract clause that when you violate that particular uh, uh, provision, maybe you will pay some amount of money or, yeah. or you will give discounts. Discount, your, yeah. Uh, and that's 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 uh, really sorry to hear that kind <laughs> of. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. At least it's just not me. Thank you. Yes. Okay. We are right on time, so it's two fifty nine. Thank you for that wonderful talk. <laughs>